Welcome to the Confident Rider podcast. I'm Jane Pike, and this podcast is a place for us to adventure together on the journey to being better humans for our horses. Each week, I'll be packing in as much goodness as I can on all things mindset, confidence, and emotional agility. I'll also be peeling back the layers of my own story and experience and talking to guests who've sparked my curiosity about their horsing life. If you're new around these parts, super awesome to have you join me. Hit subscribe and it'll be a weekly date. Training has come to be a big part of the work I do with my horses, and I'm becoming more and more aware of just what a powerful training tool it is. Georgia Bruce is not only an accomplished rider and trainer, but one of the best in the business when it comes to clicker training and positive reinforcement. In this episode, I talk to Georgia about the benefits of incorporating clicker training into your own training, how it works, and her own journey both at home and as a dual medalist at the 2008 Beijing Paralympics. I am very excited because I am sitting here, well, kind of sitting here, face-to-face on my computer with Georgia Bruce, who is amazing. Um, She is a clicker trainer who is based in Victoria at the moment. Is that right, Georgia? Yeah, Victoria, Australia. Um, And she has such a vast wealth of knowledge to share with all of us. I'm part of Georgia's group or her academy, her online academy. And I have just experienced the benefits of incorporating clicker training into my own horsing life and really I can't think of how to do things without it now. It's such an amazing tool and process to have. So Georgia has been a clicker trainer for over 20 years now and has had experience with exotic animals right through to performance horses. And now you work with a variety of different horses, including your own, where you're based now. Is that? Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Yeah, hi, Jane. Thanks for having me here and lovely to chat to you. Yeah, at the moment I'm based in Victoria and I have three horses of my own that I train for dressage, liberty, tricks, all using the clicker training. And I also give lessons around Victoria and around Australia with the clicker training. Yeah, with liberty, tricks, dressage, uh, problem solving for behaviour problems and that type of thing. Yeah, so fantastic. And you, when you talk about clicker training or positive reinforcement training, if we were to start from the platform that whoever it is that's listening today has had no experience with clicker training themselves or really a good understanding of what it's about, how would you describe clicker training for the, the layperson? Clicker training has two main differences from traditional horse training. And the first thing is that we use a marker signal and the most commonly used marker signal is a clicker. So I've got one here and makes a a little short digital sound and that tells the animal that they've done something right and they've earned a reward. So every time we make this click sound, we then give the horse uh, something they want, like a carrot or some pellets or a little bit of chaff or hay. Mostly we reward with a primary reinforcer like food Mm -hmm. and horses are hardwired to want to earn that food. So they very quickly remember what they did that earned the reward and they'll try to repeat that behaviour again. Mm -hmm. And with clicker training we have the precision of the marker signal so we can really be very clear and precise about exactly what behaviour they did that earned the reward. That's fantastic. I mean, I've, like I said previously, I've been incorporating it into my training for a couple of years now and I was under a few false impressions um, prior to that, which is why I hadn't really dived into this territory before. And frankly, now I'm in there, I'm like, what was I doing? Like, where have you been all my life? But, um, and one of the main misconceptions that I guess that I had was about using the food as a reinforcer. So 
I'm sure you come across this time and time again, but when I'm having conversations with people, there's a little bit of confusion about the difference between a horse that's mugging you for food or over keen or exuberant around food um, as compared to actually using it as a reinforcer. So what is the difference there? Like how is that, how are those two things quite significantly different? Yeah, so horses are often very motivated by food and that's why a lot of trainers will say, you know, never train with food because it'll cause your horse to get pushy or to bite or to mug you. What those behaviours, that pushing uh, behaviour is telling us is that horses are really keen and enthusiastic (laughs) to try to earn the food and by using the marker signal, that's really what makes a difference. So, That way we can pinpoint a behaviour we want the horse to do. And the very first thing we teach with the clicker training is to teach the horse that when they push on us or, you know, try to get the food, we're not going to click and mark that behaviour and reward them. We actually just stand there and wait for them to have their nose out of our space, away from the food, and then we click and then take them a treat. Mm -hmm. And within a few repetitions, they start to go, hey, if I just hold my head over here away from the food, then I'm going to get more food. (laughs) Yeah. So there's there's a defined process as to how you start to introduce the clicker and then you build like you would in any other training routine or schedule, you know, from a place where you're establishing those ground rules in terms of you're in control of the food, but it's in a way that's kind of working for both of us. (laughs) And I found that to be really interesting actually, because in the first instance, when I introduced it with D, it actually brought out his anxiety in that we could have a relatively calm session where I thought everything was sort of relaxed and then I would introduce the clicker and all of a sudden he would he would grow half a hand and become like super enthusiastic and a little bit anxious and almost anticipatory of what was coming next and there was apprehension on my part because you think oh do I kind of want to go here but the more that I worked with it the more I noticed that it actually helped his anxiety on every level because it's just uh, one of the triggers that causes that to come out basically isn't it so yeah and there's lots of different ways that we can actually um change the the level of motivation that the horse has around the food and uh one of the things we can do is just make sure the horse is not hungry before a session mm-hmm. we can use lower value reinforcers we call them like using a little bit of hay or chaff Um, rather than using something that the horse is really crazy about, like carrots or licorice. So depending on how much motivation you want, you can actually alter what types of reinforcers you use. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> my husband laughs at me now, or laughs, I say, affectionately. He's, he's occasionally done other things where basically every pocket of the jackets that I own are full of various different, <laughs> various things. So if I like lay my coat down on the couch or on the chair as I come in, there's various kind of crumbs around the outside from the treats that I've been feeding. But such a, such a cool thing. What was, well, there was something else that we were talking about prior to, to coming on. Oh, actually, we'll get to that further down the line because that was about how to phase out the clicker. So just in terms of your own personal background, how did you get started with clicker training? I was training a mare who um, she was quite advanced with the natural horsemanship and some dressage and she was a sensitive Andalusian Arab cross type mare and um, I was actually trying to teach her flying changes we could do lots of other cool stuff, ride bridlers, do liberty and things. And I was having quite a bit of trouble with the flying changes because she wasn't really sure what I wanted and she was getting quite tense and anxious. And, yeah, my friend came across the clicker training online. This was over 20 years ago. And she taught her pony to fetch with it. And she came around, showed me the pony fetching. And my horse could already do all these, you know, other cool things, but she didn't know how to fetch. And I thought, wow that's that's awesome (laughs) I want to do that (laughs) and so I had a little play with it with my mare crystal and I taught her to fetch as well and then my friend and I were talking about it and we said you know why don't we try and use it for the flying changes because we really want to be able to tell crystal right as she does that flying change that that's the behavior that I'm looking for Mm -hmm. And sure enough, so I went out there and and tried it and I had my friend on the ground and she was holding the clicker so she could see when Crystal actually did the flying change. And, you know, as she did the flying change, clicked, stop, give her a reward. 
And suddenly it was just like a light bulb went on for Crystal. She just went, oh, is that what you want me to do? And um, so it was, you know, (laughs) know, from then on I just started to use it with everything. I just found I could already teach horses to do things, but the clicker just made it so much clearer for the horse what I wanted them to do. And they also just became so much more motivated and enthusiastic about the training as well, which I thought was really cool. So cool. There's so much to be said for that clarity and also motivation in terms of it being a a pull motivation as opposed to a push. You know, it's like there's something about that, that, the motivation that's coming from the horse to seek that that reward and it actually leads on beautifully to what I was going to mention earlier which is one of the questions that comes up is people have the uh, work under the assumption that once you start clicking and treating or training them to work with the clicker under saddle that you're always and forever going to be clicking and there's no continuity to how that builds or at what point you would phase that out so when you're teaching something like the flying change, my presumption is that you will mark the behavior as soon as it is given in the beginning, early training stages. And then as you establish that, you can lengthen the criteria for what you're looking for. And so the clicks become more drawn out until you phase them out. Would that be correct or how how do you go about it under saddle yeah exactly um so initially we reward every time they give the correct response Mm -hmm. and that really builds their confidence that they know what we're asking for and they know they're going to get that reward and we call that the history of reinforcement and then once the behavior is established they can do it every time they can even you know do the behavior with distractions or in different environments so We might take them to a few different places and just retrain the behaviour and still rewarding each time. Once it's consistent and we're really happy with it, we can actually start to put the behaviour on what we call a variable schedule reinforcement, which is like how poker machines work. You know, you never know if you're going to hit the jackpot, so you just keep playing. Just give it a shot. Always give it a shot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and that way we can phase out the clicker and be able to do a competition or you know, we should be training a level above what we're actually competing or above that horse's comfort zone. So we can then uh, save the clicker and use it for something else new that we want to teach them. Mm -hmm. So awesome. So we've talked a little bit about using the clicker in the stages of creation, but there's also a real power in using it as part of a reconditioning process for horses that perhaps have come in with training issues or anxiety as a result of a a system of going about things that didn't work for them. I know at the moment, one of the uh, mares that I'm working with has, she has a lot of anxiety under saddle that's been pre-established. And so it's very much an undoing process. And the clicker has been so powerful in interrupting her normal thought patterns that take her onto that kind of automatic pilot, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here way of thinking about things and bringing her out of herself so that there's like some thought processes which are initiated. Do you work a lot with using it in that aspect as well? I mean, I know you work all around, but just to speak a little bit to that. Yeah, absolutely. It's really powerful for changing behaviours and especially with horses that are really sensitive or, you know, worried or they have that history of maybe a bit of pressure being involved in their training where they do get quite anxious. And with the click and the reward, we actually cause this dopamine surge. So when the horse hears that click, it knows the food is coming And that dopamine really helps to have the horse much more relaxed and confident. And so it can be really powerful for helping horses that are worried, like um, my mare Crystal was like that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about the clicker is it tells the horse what to do, whereas in a lot of the training it's about don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Okay, now you're right, now I'm going to leave you alone. Whereas the clicker Mm -hmm. says, yes, that's it, that's what I want. And so now the horse focuses on what we actually want them to do rather than don't do all those other things. Yeah. As someone initiating the clicks, it is super fun. Like there is so much possibility within there that I'm like having the best time with. The other thing which has really been a game changer for me, especially at this time of year where we're in 
the part of the world where it's winter right now and time can be of the essence and really getting out there and doing short, sharp sessions can have such a huge effect you know, when you compare that to the traditional, in inverted commas, way of going about things where you need to set aside an hour or to make, you know, substantial change, for me that's been a huge mindset shift and um, I really appreciate that about the effectiveness of it. Absolutely. I've taught uh, Rumby my trick horse. He does lots of different tricks and, you know, like you, I'm quite busy and, you know, I might only have five minutes to go out and spend with him and, you know, maybe I'll just teach him a fun trick. It's a bit of enrichment for him. And and within just a few sessions, uh, you can teach them something really cool like, you know, to go and fetch or to bow or, you know, even something useful like just to stand still on a mat while you brush them or whatever. But that is one thing that's quite different to your traditional training. So, yeah, yeah. And, and all of those things feed into the whole anyway, don't they? Like the confidence building and the relationship building and the fact like targeting, for instance, I know D has exceeded my expectations in terms of growth and is now nearing 17 hands. So we're using the target to teach him to put his head down to put his bridle on so things that might look from the outside to be like well what's the point of that have so many different applications when it comes to actual riding side of things or general handling side of things yeah that's right we can use it for everything you know from basic handling um you know teaching your horse to be led have its feet picked up make it easier to worm to you know make it easy to have their face washed or give an injection or, you know, all those really practical type of things right through to, you know, starting a young horse under saddle with confidence, teaching them movements under saddle, even things like float loading or going out on a trail ride. And if they see something scary like a, a log, you could ask them to touch it and then mm-hmm. you know, treat every step towards it. It's just really got so many applications that, yeah, it's amazing. And Basically, you have to have a clicker on you at all times. This is what I'm learning. I need to be armed with my clicker for any eventuality. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking and about it, introducing it to my children. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it becomes a whole mindset, you know, looking for things that we want to reward and reinforce. And, and that is so true. It, you know, we use it with our, not only our horses, but our dogs and you know, cats and people. And, and we're all motivated to, to earn that that positive reinforcement yeah it's certainly a very cool way of turning things around I think another important thing to talk about is that it doesn't have to be a clicker like we call it clicker training um, because a lot of dog trainers use a clicker um, but it's basically the marker signal so with some dog trainers they might use a consistent word like yes really nice short word so it can mark a really precise behavior but dolphin trainers will use a whistle Sometimes deaf dog trainers have used a vibrating collar, so that just a consistent marker signal that's the same every single time Mm -hmm. so the animal learns that, yes, that means I've earned a reward. So really the key, regardless of what it is that you use, is consistency of the marker signal. So it's very, I mean, it is the same process as anchoring, isn't it? I don't know if you've heard about that. I mean, you will have definitely heard about it, but use whether it's that terminology or not. But in terms of Pavlov's dog, basically like you create a neural system response as a result of firing off a trigger and that's something that I'm teaching in Joyride as well like you know being able to create feelings of confidence by allowing yourself to experience a feeling of confidence even if it's not real you know in terms of what your current experience is and then setting a trigger essentially to mark that as an experience in your nervous system so it's is it kind of similar in terms of the more you use the clicker training in your daily training, the easier it is to create a response with it further down the line simply because of the associations that it creates? Absolutely. It's uh, like Pavlov's dogs, you know, you yeah. click and then you get the food reward. And um, like you're saying with that anchoring, it, it does take repetition mm-hmm. so that that way, you know, you can then use it in all different environments, even with distraction and we are, in a sense, rewiring the brain and, you know, creating new pathways and, that weren't there before and and that's what makes it so powerful. You know, what you do with people is <laughs> is so similar to what we're doing with the horses with the positive reinforcement. 
and yeah, it just it, it makes the animal you know, feel empowered and and confident and um, and I think that's very similar to what you're doing with people. It's, it's really cool. The, the clarity as well from a human perspective is really great because not only does it make you be really intentional about what it is you're looking to create but then you also need to be really specific about when that's followed through on you know so it takes us out of ambiguity or murkiness as well because like you're just not randomly clicking for anything it's like this is how we're going to set this up this is what we're looking for and that's the moment when yes, then we followed through. And so I love that about it because it it just creates that beautiful clarity in training that helps everyone. Yeah, exactly. So we just start with one behaviour. We just pick one really easy criteria. Maybe the horse is going to, you know, accidentally do that. We set them up so they're most likely to do that really easy thing. And we get lots of repetitions of that. So so maybe even just could be touching their nose on a target. We could put it, you know, where the horse might accidentally bump into it, make it so easy that they're going to accidentally do it. And then with lots of repetition, the horse starts to do the behaviour on purpose mm-hmm. and then we can just gradually raise that criteria and ask them to, you know, maybe take a step towards the target or walk over to the target or eventually trot all the way over to the target and, you know, just that incremental raising of criteria where the horse is always successful, it, it's really a powerful way to, to change behaviour. Yeah, so so Rumby actually is like an excellent role model and spokesperson for clicker training and has his own Facebook page. He's probably got his own social media manager by now. Would it be fair to say that? Yeah, <laughs> running the show. Yeah, he's got more friends than I do. <laughs> <It's so funny. laughs> <laughs> but on his page, is it Rumby the Wonder Horse? Is that- yes. yes. He, you can see various tricks that Rumby has been performing as well as some really, I mean, it's all beautiful work, but there's also a whole lot of really beautiful things in terms of him and Angel, your other horse, working together doing different things. So you have three horses at the moment that are your main herd? Yes, I've got Rumby. He's uh, 20, so he's semi-retired now, but he still, you know, does a bit of bit of things for fun and comes out for the people when the people need him (laughs) yeah (laughs) he loves it and he's also um helping with my young horse angel she's a four-year-old welsh cob cross arabian um warm blood and she's a lot of fun um she's been clicker trained since i've had her as a two-year-old only two years but the thing with the clicker is they do learn faster and the more they do it, the better they get at learning. So with this young horse that you know, I've been clicker training right from the start, she just is so switched on and, you know, really engaged and trying to, um, you know, figure out what I want. And, yeah, I'm planning to teach her liberty, tricks, dressage, trail riding. <laughs> so cool. That is a really interesting part of it actually because not to compare my children <laughs> And I'm not having favourites here, but what I've noticed is that when I have gone to teach D something new, because I've had him from the start and we really encouraged that curiosity and worked quite a lot with the clicker as well, he is quite proactive in searching out the answer. Like he tries a variety of different things and he's thinking about it and working it out. And my other horse who I haven't had for so long, who has come to me with a totally different background, the curiosity has been trained out of her essentially. And that thought process has been trained out of her. And it's interesting to observe when you introduce the same stimulus and you're asking the same question how they respond differently. Like I've got the searching one over here and the one that's kind of like um, almost afraid to like have an opinion, you know, for what that might mean. So it's a, it is such a powerful way of bringing them out of themselves in that sense too and, and especially if they've been a bit shut down. Absolutely. And like you say, some horses will start off where they're almost too enthusiastic about the food and, you know, we teach them the manners around the food and and to regulate their emotion and their self-control. And so there's that end of the spectrum. And then there's also the horses that are really a bit shut down and a bit worried. And those ones with the the regular clicker training, um, we just keep the sessions really short and high value reinforces things they really want. And 
and they become much more uh, enthusiastic. They come out of their shell. And so it really does work with all different types of horses with you know, different backgrounds and personalities. And, yeah, we can just alter the approach a little depending on what type of horse we've got. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's lovely to see those ones come out of their shell when they've been in a place where, oh, I'd rather do nothing than do something and be wrong. Exactly. And then suddenly they're like, oh, if I do this, I might get a reward. And they just gradually. Oh, treats. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ever been in that place where you know there is so much possibility that exists for you and your horse, but you are the weakest link in the equation? It might be anxiety, doubt or fear that's getting in your way. Maybe you've hit a stuck place and you don't know how to get yourself moving forward. Or maybe competition is your thing and the wheels are falling off under pressure. Well, I've seen hundreds of riders who've shared those exact same concerns come out the other side after joining my online program, Joyride. If you're looking to create a riding life filled with clarity, purpose, and confidence, this program will help you have it. Jump on my website, confidentrider.online, and join me today. I would love to adventure with you. So you are incredibly humble because I have been refreshing my memory on your bio, reading it prior to us chatting, and you have represented Australia on 12 different occasions, 12 different occasions, and two of those have been at the World Para Dressage Championships, and two of them were at the Paralympic Games, first in Athens in 2004, is that right, and then in Beijing in 2008? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that and not only that, no, I'm keeping on going. I know you're <laughs> cringing for those of you who can't see. There's uh, two bronze medals that came out of Beijing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Doing a round of applause. If I wasn't bowing to you before, <laughs> I'm bowing to you now. So talk us through that. How was that whole experience? Uh, yeah, it was It was something I did um, very intensely for a long time. You know, I love dressage. I love the training of of the horse and that real feeling of harmony uh, with the horse. And with Crystal, actually, the horse I was mentioning earlier, she took me down that dressage road Mm -hmm. and um, I ended up competing at the nationals. And I've got one short arm. I don't have a thumb on my right arm and a radial bone uh, because of aerial spraying of Agent Orange when my mum was pregnant. Uh, So I was born with that and I compete in the open competition in the dressage and I was doing quite well with that and somebody said, hey, you should have a go with the the Paralympics. And so, yeah, (laughs) I I did that and it was really wonderful. When you say you did that, that (laughs) seems like quite a succinct statement for (laughs) moving from being at home to someone suggesting the Paralympics to actually competing in in, um, Beijing and Athens. You were over in Europe for a period of time, is that right? Or was it Europe you were based in at various dressage stables? Yeah, it's an extensive process of, um, you know, going through all the selection trials and, you know, travelling around Australia to, to get to those selection trials and then yeah, I was lucky enough to be selected to go to Europe quite a few times. And when we went over there, we would ride a borrowed horse mm-hmm. um, and we'd have, you know, sometimes two weeks with the horse, sometimes up to three months, depending on each situation. And I do feel really lucky to have had those experiences because it did teach me so much about uh, first of all dressage I was lucky to ride with some really fantastic trainers uh, like Huberta Schmidt uh, who are just you know um, I think he's amazing Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and also just getting to ride some amazing dressage horses as well that were you know at at high levels and um, having to uh, go out in that competition environment and you know put a test together and because there's yeah, like that. layers of intensity here because, you know, when we you can understand the enormity of training a horse that is your horse and then going to the competition and having that relationship with them and understanding of their nuances and quirks and, you know, everything that comes with individuality, but then 
to throw on top of that, not only riding at the Olympics or, you know, competitions such as the Para Dressage Championships, but to then have within that the fact that you're a relatively new combination is quite something really. Like did you, when you worked together, was that a very intense period of time in training that you spent with someone else or how did it work when you were going through the process of getting to know the dressage horses that you were riding at the events? Yeah, so we would go over there with the Australian national coach um, and they would usually source the horses and then we would spend the preparation time before the competition with the owner, so working very closely with the owner and our Australian coach and getting to know the horse and it is, you know, such an individual thing. We all give our aids slightly differently when we're riding and, you know, each horse has a different level of sensitivity and and just being able to quite quickly figure out and connect with the horse like that and then ask them to trust you enough to perform in a <laughs> big competition environment. It, it certainly was a challenge that I enjoyed to be able to meet so many horses and to learn from them. So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And between you and me, I mean, we won't tell the horses that you mentioned this, but did you have a favourite? <laughs> oh, absolutely. The horse that I rode in Hong Kong it, for the Beijing Paralympics, he was 18 hand high horse called Victory Salute and uh, he was owned by Carolyn Lieutenant. Some people probably know him because Brett Parbury, an Australian dressage rider, he also rode him in the in the dressage and, um, you know, he just, I just bonded straight away with that horse and I just had, you know, such a fantastic time with him travelling, you know, going, uh, flying to another country with him and, you know, uh, experiencing all that with a horse was <laughs> was quite yeah. special. So. Makes me quite teary to think about it actually. And the two bronze medals, I mean, did you wear those in the shower for a period of time afterwards? <laughs> I'm not sure I would have taken those off for quite a while. I, it's possible I could still be wearing them. <laughs> Oh, look, when you put that much into it, I was sort of competing at that level for 10 years beforehand and it was just so surreal to to have that experience and to, you know, get those results as well. So, yeah, I was really, really proud of that. Amazing. You should be. It's such a credit to you. I could go on about this all day. So when you had the chance to work with the horses, was Clicker, you're obviously already fairly heavily involved in clicker training with your own horses and then did you have a chance to introduce that to the horses you were working with or was that quite a separate thing given they were borrowed rides? Yeah because they were borrowed horses I stuck with what the owner did and I then took that information home from all the all the horses that I'd learned from and then I'd sort of go home and experiment with my own horses and adding all that you know that dressage that I'd learned and then adding that with the clicker um, and I was just finding at home you know how much easier it was with my own horses but yeah because they were borrowed horses I I just stuck with the classical training methods that they were used to. And now you have this beautiful fusion of those classical methods with the clicker at home that we're all reaping the benefit of. So I'm very grateful for that. So at the moment, in addition to the -the on-the-ground work that you do with horses and giving lessons, you also have an online academy where people can be guided through right from the basics of clicker training work so what we've talked about with kind of setting it up in the very first instance do they need to have um, a level of experience in a, to be able to join you in that or is that taking it right from the top yeah it goes right from the beginning so you know anyone that owns a horse really can join us um, horses of all ages breeds disciplines you know, it'll take you right from, you know, catching your horse. If you've got a wilder a problem horse, it's difficult to catch. And we go right through all the groundwork and, and you yeah, know, getting into the, the riding and liberty tricks and even into dressage. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't really matter, in your opinion, where you want to take it. Like the foundations are essentially the same regardless of, of what your area of interest or discipline is. Yeah, once we teach the horse the fundamentals of the clicker training, how it works, so they understand what it means and we teach them the manners around the food and Mm -hmm. that bit of Mm self-control, then, yeah, we can really use it for anything. And so what I've 
done with my course is is help people to learn how the clicker training works. And once you understand it, then you can go and use it for you know, anything that you really want to teach your horse or your cat or dog. Or <laughs> I'm clicking my head off. Let, let me tell you, I'm like a, a clicker, <laughs> clicker devotee <laughs> now. I think it's such an amazing, amazing tool. What is your, what are your aspirations then? Like, where would you like to take your riding personally? I mean, you've hit such high levels already. Um, do you, is that something you want to go back to or you have a different way of taking things now or a different direction you're heading in? That's the word I was looking for. I had an injury a couple of years ago where I was at a clinic and I had a horse rear up and land on my head and I had a bit of a neck injury. And so I didn't think, I didn't expect to be getting back into that level of competition again, but I've really appreciated your joyride mm-hmm. <laughs> group as well. And, you know, all your experience about, you know, returning to to the competition arena and, and building your confidence. And initially I would have said, you know, I wasn't expecting to do that, but the more I've sort of... Um, I see an opening. <laughs> <laughs> I won't rule anything out. I'm just I'm you know, excited I'm now. <laughs> I love riding and, you know, I seem to have another warm blood. So. <laughs> Excellent. I'm a, I'm, I've got some good training after being at WEG last year with Robin and Warwick. I've become an excellent on-the-side cheerleader. The reining, I admit, is quite different to the dressage once I realised that you could actually scream your head off in the reining arena. So, you know, just a subtle kind of... I'm available to be your cheerleader should you be going to the next Olympics, just putting it out there right now, okay? so Thanks, Jane. (laughs) I can can perfect my one-man Mexican wave and all sorts of things. I've got so many possibilities that are happening right now. (laughs) So if people are like, which clearly they are, going, Jane, just get to the chase. Where can we find Georgia and get in with this awesomeness ourselves? Where do they go to find you? clickertraining.org is my website mm-hmm. uh, and I've also got a Facebook page click with horses and you know YouTube Instagram all those things but mainly the website clickertraining.org you can Perfect. jump on there and sign up for the academy and I'll have all of Georgia's links in my show notes so that you can jump on there and zoom straight over should you desire well thank you so much Georgia I'm so appreciative of your time today thanks for having me and Thanks very much for your. Can we end with a click? (laughs) Yes. Okay. Here we go. Oh, perfect. (laughs) That's it from us today. Thank you so much for hanging out. Once again, if you want to learn more about Georgia or sign up to her online academy, you can find her at clickertraining.org and I'll include all of her relevant links in the show notes on my website also, confidentrider.online. Have a great week and I'll talk to you again next episode.